Our final reading is from 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 8. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people but God, who tests our hearts. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in a brief moment of prayer? Father God, we come before you and we are thankful. We are thankful that we can come to your place of to this place of worship and to honor you and to praise your wonderful and holy name be with me now as i share this message that you have laid on my heart let it not be my words but your words spoken through me keep me hold me keep me steady and allow these words to encourage everyone here today and let it encourage them and let it encourage me let it encourage us to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ to the best of our ability. And in everything that we do, may we give you every honor and praise. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. As always, it is an absolute joy to be here in this sacred place with such kind and wonderful people, such kind and wonderful Christ-centered people. I thought I would begin by echoing Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica that we find in 1 Thessalonians. Because when I read these words, I think of you and how thankful I am for you and your example to me and to others. Paul begins this letter saying, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord uh, Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I am thankful for this church. I extend my love to you, your faith in Christ Jesus, your love for others, and your perseverance in the gospel is deeply encouraging to me. Likewise, Paul is encouraged by the Thessalonian church. As I was looking through our lectionary readings for this week, I became quite excited, filled with joy at this particular passage. This epistle reading from 1 Thessalonians includes one of my all-time favorite verses. At the end of our passage this morning, we read the words in verse 8, So we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. A number of years ago, when I was a student at the University of Mary Hardin Baylor, I became close friends with Dr. Sean Shannon. At the time, she served the university as the director of the Baptist Student Ministries, the BSM, she was absolutely phenomenal in that role, and during my time at UMHB, I discovered her gift of encouraging others with her charm, her wisdom, her wit, and her amazing ability to have a conversation with someone. There is an art to having good conversations. 
When you talked with Sean, she would tune herself into every word that you had to say so that you knew that what you had to say was important, no matter how small the topic might be. And then she would find some way to connect with it so that it was an engaging conversation. Someone with great pastoral care, someone who can preach and teach, I have found in Sean not only one of my greatest spiritual mentors, but a dear friend. For four out of five years I was at UMHB, I was a member of what we called the Ministry Leadership Council at the BSM. This was a group facilitated by Sean Shannon, comprised of quite a few students who led ministries on campus. We would study scripture and spiritual disciplines together weekly, we would visit together, we would play games and share meals, and we encouraged one another as we discovered new ways to lead our ministries. One year, this verse was our theme verse. So let me read it again. So we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. To me, this serves as a powerful reminder to us that the work of the gospel involves not just sharing what is written in scripture, but sharing our entire Christ-centered lives with others. Last time I was with you, I emphasized Jesus being the center of our everything and how when Jesus is the center of our everything, we show great care for and love towards others. I would continue this conversation today by saying that if Jesus is the center of our everything, then we ought to share our lives with others. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. The group we had at UMHB fostered a community where we shared not only scripture and spiritual disciplines with each other, but we shared our very lives with each other. Because Jesus is the center of our everything, we were motivated to share Christ's love in every facet of our lives the best we could. And sometimes it manifested itself in intentional conversations with a friend or a shared meal together. And so my hope is that you walk away from church today encouraged to share your lives with others as you share the gospel with others, the true gospel of a risen Savior. Whether it's with other people you encounter throughout the week, uh, whether it's a friend or someone you meet. Because we, with Jesus at the center of our everything, love others so much, we should be delighted to share our lives with the world around us. So perhaps we can take a few moments to explore this text together. Paul writes this letter to a community in Thessalonica, and he is deeply encouraged by their faithfulness. And he wants to encourage them to press on, to keep up the good work. Their work, as he describes it in chapter 1, is a work produced by faith, and their labor is prompted by love, and their endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. They are so faithful that their witness is spreading throughout Macedonia and Achaia. And so now Paul wants to encourage them, despite the challenges that they may face, to keep being faithful, to keep sharing their Christ-centered lives with others, to keep sharing their Christ-centered lives with others. Now, there are challenges. They were challenged. We're still challenged today. Scripture doesn't guarantee an easy life, nor does it guarantee that we'll always do everything the right way all the time. Challenges will come, and we will make mistakes. But even in the midst of those challenges and those mistakes, may we be encouraged by Paul's encouragement to the Thessalonian church. You may be asking, well, what are some of the challenges and possible pitfalls that we may face Paul describes a few in our reading today. In verse 2, he says, We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Treated outrageously in Philippi. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas were in Philippi. And there was a slave girl who was possessed by an evil spirit, allowing her the ability to predict the future. And because of this, she was taken advantage of by those profiting off her misfortune. This was until Paul commanded the spirit to leave this little girl and stop tormenting her. 
Now that the girl was healed, no longer being afflicted by the spirit, those making money off of her no longer had a source of income they could get off of her. So they brought Paul and Silas before the magistrates. They were stripped, beaten severely, thrown into prison. It was a consequence of living out the gospel of healing the slave girl. They were treated outrageously in Philippi. But even in the midst of that treatment, that strong opposition, they were committed to the work of the gospel. Now, most Christians in the United States of America will not face that level of persecution that Paul and Silas did, at least not in our lifetimes. I mean, we may face criticism, we may be ostracized by people we care about, but we won't face severe persecution like they did. I'm constantly amazed and encouraged and inspired by fellow believers around the world who do face strong persecution, who truly fear for their very lives. I remember when I was at UMHB, a fellow student shared a story with me of when he was in China and he visited a house church. It had paper thin walls and they were worshiping at the top of their lungs. And he asked them, well, aren't you scared for your, your lives? Aren't you scared that uh, people will come after you? And they said, yes, we are scared, we're terrified. But that's not gonna keep us from proclaiming the name of the one we know, the name above all the names, the name that gives us so much hope. I hope that their example and the example of Paul and Silas who were in prison, and yet they prayed and sang hymns, I hope that their examples encourage us to remain faithful and to share our love with others even when times are difficult, even if we face criticism uh, from others on account of our faith. I pray that we continue in all circumstances to love others as Christ loves and to share our Christ-centered lives with those around us. Because we love others so much and share, sharing the gospel and, and our lives should delight us. And like Paul and Silas who were beaten and imprisoned for standing in the way of injustice perpetrated on the girl being taken advantage of for financial gain, may we stand rooted in a gospel that calls us to speak out when we see something we know is wrong. May we boldly care for and advocate for the well-being of others as Paul and Silas did. That is how we can share our Christ-centered lives with others. Paul continues in verses 3 and 4, For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We were not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. The encouragement that we can glean from Paul's words here is to focus on pleasing God rather than pleasing ourselves and others. There are those in this world who will have impure motives, those who will use their positions of authority to take advantage of others, thus causing emotional and spiritual, sometimes physical harm. They'll excuse that by abusing scripture in their faith. They may say, well, if you're against me, then you're against God because I speak for God. There are certainly those with impure motives. Now, I never want to stand up here and preach as if only others fall into this trap and somehow we're immune to it. Somehow we can't fall into the same trap because we can and will fall short. So perhaps I might encourage you as I also encourage myself to recognize possible impure motives, repent of them when we see them, and strive to be motivated by the gospel rather than those impure selfish motives. I might also add, as Paul speaks here, that we strive to avoid pleasing others when it doesn't please God. The gospel work should challenge us. The gospel work should challenge others. Sometimes the gospel does say things we want to hear, but other times it steps on our toes. Other times it gets right in our face and tells us things that we don't want to hear, but it challenges us. It causes us to recognize when we err and ask ourselves, how can we be better? How can we be better followers of Christ Jesus? How can we honor God rather than pleasing ourselves and others? Paul encourages us to avoid impure, selfish gains and encourages us to seek what pleases God over what pleases ourselves and others. 
This is how we can live with Christ Jesus at the center of our everything. This is how we are to share our Christ-centered lives with others. Christ-centered lives, lives centered on Christ Jesus rather than impure motives. Paul also warns against flattery and greed and again seeking praise from others instead of God. Verses 5 and 6. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. We never used flattery. Again, it would be easy for any of us to take the gospel message and relay that message in a way to where it says things that people want to hear. It would be easy to avoid difficult conversations. It would be easy to only say what makes people feel good rather than challenging them. That would be the easy thing to do. It would be easy to just gloss over the prophets, including Amos, who scolds the northern kingdom for his mistreatment of the poor and the marginalized and not ask how perhaps our society mistreats the poor and marginalized today. But we're not always called to do the easy thing or to only say what makes people feel good without challenging them, without challenging us to be better followers of Christ. Early church father John Christosom once wrote, Let no idle or random word escape your lips. Let us consider first whether what we say can be of any benefit and can provide edification for those who hear it. Let us say what we have to say with great clarity, just as if someone were standing by and writing down our words. Let us be challenged by Christosom and by Paul and speak boldly and with great clarity when it comes to sharing the gospel. Rather than just speaking what we all want to hear all the time, let us speak boldly so that it challenges us to be better followers of Christ. This is how we are to share our Christ-centered lives with others, sharing a gospel that challenges us, that helps us become better followers of Christ Jesus. Paul also says, nor did we put on a mask to cover up our greed. There are certainly those who use flattering words to cover up their greed. Many prosperity gospel televangelists, for example, twist scripture to say what sounds good. They argue that if you just do the right things always, if you work hard enough, if you donate enough money to them, God will reward you with riches and your life will be all happy and glad and rosy and everything will be okay. Except the Bible doesn't say that. Luke 6, 20 and 21, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves can break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. Romans 5, 3 and 4, We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Acts 5, 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, that name being Jesus Christ. So you're saying that we will struggle, we will go through hard times, we shouldn't take stock in the treasures of this world because we have hope and can persevere in the gospel knowing that one day we will see the face of Christ Jesus? Yes. It's a starkly different message than what many flashy televangelists might have you believe. I remember a hospice chaplain telling me once that he visited the hospital room of a woman who blamed herself and her lack of faith because she wasn't successful by the world's standards. She had listened to these preachers for a long time and she thought, well, if I'm just faithful enough, then I will be successful. And then when she wasn't successful, she thought that God was judging her, and so she tried to take her own life because she thought God was ashamed of her and her lack of success. 
Instead of listening to these passages, the true gospel I just read to you, she listened to a superficial gospel, one that we don't find in scripture, a superficial gospel communicated by many preachers so that they can get money from listeners and live in a life of luxury. If we are to share our Christ-centered, gospel-centered lives with others, then we must be listeners, doers, and communicators of the true gospel that encourages us to persevere in Christ, both in good seasons and in difficult seasons, because we will face difficult seasons. Lastly, Paul says, emphasizing once again that we shouldn't work to please people over God, he says in verse 6, We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Rather than focusing on what gets us praise from others, rather than communicating only what others want to hear, rather than the truth, let us speak the truth of the gospel. Let us strive to do what honors and pleases God. What I have described here today is how we can share our very lives with others, how we can share our Christ-centered lives with others. We will suffer, we will face hardships, and others may criticize us, but let us encourage one another in the midst of those challenges. Let us also avoid impure motives, flattery, and an untrue gospel that only seeks to make people feel good rather than encouraging us and helping us to persevere in difficult situations. Because we know, we trust and believe in a God who watches over us, who will never leave, never forsake us. This is how we can treat others fairly, how we can encourage one another and share our lives with others which are centered on Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus being the center of our everything. So we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. As believers who have Jesus at the center of our everything, let us strive to share with others the true gospel. And let us strive to share our lives with one another. Let us strive to challenge one another so that we can become better followers. We can share our lives with each other when we share our stories. As believers, you each have a story of how God has redeemed you, how Christ has been with you both in trials and triumphs, how God's presence is with you even in troubling times. We each have a story that is worth sharing to others. We can also share our lives with others simply by being present with one another. This is how we share the true gospel with those around us. This is how we emulate Christ's love with each other. We show up when others are hurting. Perhaps it's through encouraging words or just listening and sitting in silence with someone else who may be grieving, just letting them know that you're there for them, that you care for them. Sharing our lives that are centered on Christ Jesus means sharing a gospel of a Savior who came to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. If our lives are centered on that Jesus whose name we boldly proclaim, then we should hear Christ's words in our reading from Matthew today. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let our example be the example of Moses we read earlier, where people uh, were moved by his example. As I mentioned to you on previous occasions, When we say love your neighbor as ourselves, there are no non-neighbors. Everyone is a neighbor. Immigrants, the poor, victims of assault and violence, those who have endured racism and bigotry, kids with special needs, those living without adequate food or housing, those suffering from cancer and Alzheimer's, they are our neighbors. Sharing our Christ-centered lives rooted in the gospel should mean that we advocate for those whom society overlooks. We are to boldly love others as Christ has called us to do. So may we be encouraged by Paul's words to share our very lives with others, lives that are rooted in the true and unfailing gospel of Christ Jesus. May we delight in sharing our lives with others because we love our fellow image bearers so much, because we love each other so much. May this be how we keep Jesus at the center of our everything, by sharing our lives, our Christ-centered lives, 
with others. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you that we, as you have reminded us, we are fearfully and wonderfully made in you. We bear your image. Use us and every part of us to share your love with others. May we share our Christ-centered lives with those in this church, with those in our family, with those in our world, those who are feeling good and those who are hurting. May we be proclaimers of your name. May we share the true gospel, the gospel that calls on us to care for one another, to love as you have first loved us. In everything that we do, may we give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen.